Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining PHCA for today's webinar, Overview of Pennsylvania's Medical Marijuana Program. This is the last PHCA webinar for 2019. I'm Wendy Johnson with the Pennsylvania Healthcare Association. Before we begin, I have a few housekeeping items to cover. PHCA offers monthly webinars to members to receive updates from department staff on regulations, learn from industry experts on current trends and practices, and to gain a better understanding of practical application tools to equip you so that you may continue to provide the highest level of quality care possible. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the PHCA website. The webinar has been approved for one continuing education credit for PHCA members. Credits will be uploaded to NAB within the next two weeks, and for those who have provided us with their unique NAB number, we will, up, we will upload those um, on your behalf. I'll be sending a link to a quick survey. Your feedback is important to us and to our speaker, so please take a moment to complete the survey. All attendees will be in listen-only mode. However, throughout the presentation, please feel free feel free to submit questions using your questions pane on the right hand of your screen and our presenter will address them at the end of the presentation. Today's webinar is being presented by Lolly Benich, patient liaison for the Office of Medical Marijuana in the Pennsylvania Department of Health. The webinar will provide important information on the Commonwealth's high quality, efficient and compliant medical marijuana program, covering its vision, mission, and guiding principles. The presentation will illustrate how those suffering with serious medical conditions are provided access to medical marijuana through a safe and efficient method of delivery. I'll now turn the webinar over to Lolly. Thank you, Wendy. Hi, everyone. I'm happy to be joining you today. Um, so as Wendy said, I'm going to be giving um, the overview of the program and um, I generally uh, offer this um, educational material to patients and caregivers. That's usually my audience. And, um, and that's usually folks who have a loved one or um, maybe they are interested in actually obtaining a medical marijuana identification card so that they can um, participate in the program. So um, that's my focus as the patient liaison is to be communicating with um, the um, our uh, patients and caregivers, but I'm happy to um, offer that same information to you today. Um, but I do want to um, let you know that I unfortunately just may not have all of the answers to your questions. And I know that that's always very painful to hear, so I'm getting it out of the way. Um, but a lot of these questions, um, you know, I'll, I'll answer what I can when we get to the end of the presentation, but some of them um, will have to be directed um, to um, the Department of Human Services. Um, and uh, I know PHCA will also have resources for you as well. Um, and this is an evolving program and um, things are, you know, changing often. So um, our website is also a great source of accurate, up-to-date information as well. So I'll have information on um, where to find particular things uh, throughout this presentation. So I'll go ahead and get started here. Um, let's see. So basically, um, our, um, our mission is to provide medical marijuana to patients with the serious medical conditions that are included in our current list. Um, and ju just make sure that we have a safe and effective method of distribution, that we are um, mindful of any ways that we can prevent diversion. Um, and we are also extremely interested in promoting research through our, um, it's often referred to as the Chapter 20 Research Program. Um, and I'll tell you more about that as well. Um, so uh, the folks that are going to be obtaining medical marijuana ID cards to participate in the program are going to be residents of the Commonwealth. Um, so, uh, you know, you have to have right now um, a valid form of uh, ID to even register for the program. So 
if you're registering for a medical marijuana ID card, you have to have a valid form of, of ID in the state of Pennsylvania. Now we do have some folks who do not have a valid ID. Um, maybe they're um, you know, elderly and, and they can actually have a caregiver apply on their behalf. Um, if they have a son or daughter or you know, any, any one that they can trust to apply to be their caregiver who does have a valid ID, um, that will suffice. So our office is often helping people navigate this um, and, and just sort of find the, I, I guess the best path that they um, can be on through this program. So um, I will also give you our contact information to pass along to anyone you know that, um, that just needs help getting through the registration process because we obviously want to help them with that. This is our current conditions list. Um, when the law had originally passed in um, April of 2016, this list was um, 17 conditions. Since then, there have been um, additions. We've had six conditions added. Um, most recently, Dr. Levine added anxiety and Tourette's. And um, the Medical Marijuana Advisory Board is uh, a 15 member board made of law enforcement, medical professionals, doctors, patients, caregivers, and that board meets quarterly and they review applications that have been submitted on adding or, um, or reducing conditions um, or rather taking them away. Um, and they uh, always go over those applications that have been submitted and the board will vote to add or reduce the conditions but Dr. Levine, being the chair of the board, has the final say in what gets added um, and what does not. So um, she always reviews their decisions and then makes her, her decision later and announces it. So this is our most recent conditions list, but that could change in the future. There is a mechanism for adding conditions. That information is on our website. So if anyone is interested in getting a condition added, um, they can do so um, with the information, with the application that's available on our website under the board tab, um, the Medical Marijuana Advisory Board tab. And I have a little Shiba Inu at my side here and she's growling at the wind. So I'm sorry if, if you can, you can probably hear that, um, but she's very cute. So if you could see her, it wouldn't be so obnoxious. Um, so this, um, this is information on caregivers. So as I was saying, we do have folks who are not able for any number of reasons to get out and go to the dispensary themselves. So we do have the ability for caregivers to obtain a card and get approved to um, actually go and purchase on behalf of a patient. So caregivers typically are gonna be 21 or older, although we can make exceptions if they are under the age of 21. So between the ages of 18 and 21, if they um, you know, come to us and explain why it's imperative that they become a caregiver, we can make an exception, but the law does um, specifically say they should be over the age of 21 unless otherwise um, permitted. And they have to submit their fingerprints through the FBI um, just the same way I'm sure all of you have, have done the exact same thing through Identigo. Um, and uh, as long as they do not have um, a drug-related charge in the past five years, um, they, well, I'll tell you, sorry, I, there is no really um, eloquent way to put this, but every single uh, background check that comes back with any record is going to be reviewed. Um, we have to review everybody um, before they get approved to be a caregiver. If they have a drug charge within the past five years, that is an automatic denial um, per Act 16. Um, we just cannot approve them if they have a drug charge within the past five years. If it's outside of that window, um, it would go to review. Now, there could be you know, various other charges that could affect whether or not someone is approved, but that's the one that's specifically written into the law. So we you know, definitely can't make an exception to that. 
Um, and so, yes, caregivers um, can uh, obtain medical marijuana for patients under the age of 18, of course. Um, so we have, you know, parents, legal guardians. You can have a third party caregiver, someone that you have designated. We have, um, you know, parents who may have some kind of charge on their record and they are not able to be the caregiver for their child. And so they may designate a friend or, um, uh, you know, a grandmother, um, whomever they choose. And that person can go through the same caregiver process and obtain the card and make legal purchases on behalf of that minor patient. Now, um, I don't know if you all would be providing any um, services for kiddos that are still in school, but you know we give this guidance to everyone regardless. Um, so uh, the Department of Education has uh, has issued guidance that has uh, basically given a caregiver the ability to get permission from the school principal to go onto the school grounds to administer the medical marijuana to the patient. And then they must go back off school grounds with the medicine. So you're not going to be sending this to school with your kiddo. Um, you would be you know, requesting permission and going onto the school grounds just for administration and then leaving. Um, and you know, we, we know that that's not ideal for a lot of people who want to administer midday to a kiddo, but um, you know, being that it is still a schedule one federally illegal substance, we have a lot of hurdles, and um, I probably don't need to explain that any further. I'm sure you're all aware that that does um, that does complicate things, and it makes it keeps everybody on their toes um, trying to figure out how to uh, meet the needs of all of the patients that we have. So a caregiver can be designated by more than one patient. So um, I'm a caregiver for my daughter. And actually, I'll just, um, can I go? Oh, I can't. Shoot. Um, I wanted to go back and show you her picture was on the slide before. Um, but then I goofed up and, and skipped anyway. But um, that was her picture on the school slide. Um, and so I, I applied to be the caregiver for her as a minor. And then um, once I was approved and had my card, I have been contacted by numerous other patients who for you know various reasons just needed the assistance of a caregiver, some for a long time, some for a short period of time. So I was able to meet the needs of anywhere up to five patients at a time. Um, I have been, um, I've unfortunately had some patients that have passed away um, and so you know then I was able to be designated by someone else so you know as long as it's not over five the system will allow you to care for up to five patients as a caregiver and it's been um, really actually very um, wonderful to to be able to do that for um, some folks it's been very eye-opening and it's given me a lot of perspective on how this program is working for people out in the community so it's been really wonderful um, so anyway these are the key participants for our program um, each of these participants plays an extremely important role and we all sort of just have to work together to um, to pull this off in the most responsible way we can. Um, and so I'm just gonna go over the roles of each of these groups. Um, so I've kind of already gone over the patients and caregivers, but I wanna show you this supply chain which really gives a good look at uh, the, the um, path that the medical marijuana takes. So from the time it's planted, typically it would be like a tissue sample. Um, so from that time all the way to when it's dispensed at the dispensary counter to the patient or caregiver, it is uh, barcoded and tracked and inventoried. It's always in someone's inventory. So it's going to um, go through that entire process with someone always knowing who is in possession of every single plant and product and everything that's processed, every oil and, and um, you know, topical uh, lotion that's made. Everything at all times has to be in someone's inventory. So that's to prevent diversion. Um, when the legislature was um, crafting this bill, they of course wanted to be 
uh, very, very um, uh, mindful of any ways that they could prevent diversion. And the best way to do that is through the seed to sale tracking system. Um, which is um, a, a very, very sophisticated system that a lot of states have uh, begun to use. And um, so, you know, some of the states that you would hear about, um, you know, typically out, out west, you know, this has been going on since 1996. Um, California was the first state in 96 to um, pass some, some sort of law that allowed uh, folks to use medical marijuana. And then in, I believe it was 1998 that Oregon did. Um, I don't, well, you're recording this. I was going to say, don't quote me on this, but that's fruitless. Um, I might have that date wrong, but I, I believe it was sometime around then. But we are one of 34 states that has a law. And so, you know, everybody has their own law because this is federally illegal. So states are, you know, doing their own thing and, you know, not one really looks like the other. Um, but you'd see some states where, um, you know, diversion was more commonly taking place and, you know, the, the medical products were probably getting into the hands of, of people that didn't necessarily qualify for the medical program. Um, they didn't have a seed to sale system, um, which was making sure that those products weren't diverted into the recreational market or rather the black market. Um, and the other important thing about the seed to sale system is it's tied to the patient and caregiver registry. So when our patients and caregivers use their cards to make purchases, all of that information is stored as well. Um, we have the ability to take a very close look at what is going on in this program at all times um, to the extent that we can actually, um, we have the ability to, you know, request information um, at a certain time. And, you know, all of that is stored in the system. And it, it really gives us the ability to regulate this program um, very responsibly. And, um, and also, in the event that there is you know, some sort of adverse reaction um, beyond the point of sale and we need to do a product recall, a system like this gives you the ability to do that fairly um, seamlessly because you know exactly where that product has gone um, at the point of sale and you're able to then you know, reach out and make sure that um, you know, no more adverse events are, are occurring. So, um, so I just think this is a very important feature that um, sets a lot of states apart from various other states. And, um, and I'm, I think it's great that we have this. Um, I also want to point out that there's two phases of lab testing here. So um, unlike most states that only require one phase of lab testing, we require two. So that's one um, at harvest when it's still, you know, plant matter, and then one um, uh, after it's been processed and, uh, and then we're testing the oils. We do also have stability testing. So um, our labs will be testing products that have already been on the shelves for a matter of time to make sure that um, nothing has you know, leached into that medicine that shouldn't. Um, so lots of lab testing. And that really is what makes a program a medical program. Um, I was actually one of the moms that was working on this issue for a while back since uh, 2013. And um, we were often talking to legislators about this and um, and I don't think any of them had any bad intentions, but we would often get sort of that nudge and a wink and say, you know, just go get your kiddos something off the black market. Um, and although some of us chose to do that, we didn't always have the ability or it was not safe to assume that every patient who needs this has the ability to obtain something that is safe um, and that has been lab tested. So um, it, it's important for more states, for every state really, to take a close look at that and to um, make sure that patients are getting something that has gone through all of the important testing for molds, pesticides, mildews, um, all, of, all of those things are, are just imperative for a patient. 
So these are the forms that are available in our program. Um, when the law was passed, um, again, I had mentioned, you know, that certain conditions were added and um, we also had the dry leaf added. So the dry leaf or the flower, um, as it's more than likely going to be referred to, um, was added by the Medical Marijuana Advisory Board when they issued a report in May of 2018, I believe it was. Um, and they were tasked initially with looking at other states and collecting feedback to uh, make recommendations on what we could do what the Department of Health could do to improve the program, to lower costs for patients. And one of the, I think, most common uh, answers to the question of how to keep costs low was to add the dry leaf or flower, the unprocessed um, uh, delivery method for patients. Now, I will tell you they are still uh, prohibited from smoking. So. In other states, you'll actually see that they are selling um, joints, pre-rolled, they called them, uh, pre-rolled packages um, out of uh, medical dispensaries. And, um, and, you know, that's all well and good, but that's not how it works in Pennsylvania. So smoking is strictly prohibited, so you will not see any pre-roll um, coming out of the dispensary. Um, what you will see is containers of the flour. Um, you can't see inside the container, of course, until you take it home and, um, and you've purchased it. But you can purchase flour and you can purchase a vaping device from the dispensary or from elsewhere. Um, although the ones at the dispensary are going to be um, devices that have been approved and, and deemed safe. Um, and so also you have um, staff in the dispensary that's going to be able to teach you how to use the device if you're purchasing it from them. So I think that's really um, a great way to go, especially for someone who um, is very new to using medical marijuana. We have some patients that are pretty seasoned. Um, users and they're pretty comfortable with, um, you know, they, they know exactly what they need and want, um, whereas we have so many patients who are just brand new to this and they're really going to rely on the advice they're given by the medical professionals and the patient care specialists at the dispensaries. And um, what's really fantastic is um, every single dispensary will have a medical professional professional on staff. So I'll tell you a little bit more about that, but I'll wrap up this part about um, about the forms. So um, I do wanna mention too, along with smoking being prohibited, right now edibles are prohibited as well. So um, meaning our grower processors cannot manufacture edibles, our dispensaries cannot sell ed edibles. However, there is, um, there is a uh, statement in the act that says that, I'm paraphrasing of course, but a patient or a caregiver can um, purchase a form suitable to mix with food or drink to, to um, help their patients with ingestion or help themselves with ingesting the medication. So they are allowed to make edibles at home. Um, however, they will not be sold out of dispensaries without the law actually being amended. Um, patients are also you know, very often requesting that we allow them the ability to grow their own medicine, um, but the law also strictly prohibits that. So right now, um, we would not be able to allow any patients to grow their own medicine without the legislature making certain amendments to the law. So um, I, I know that that disappoints a lot of patients who would like to save on all of those costs, but um, it's just not, not in our ability to do that for them. Um, so this is your standard packaging that you'll see out of a dispensary. Um, looks pretty professional. I, I think um, I think often people are surprised um, to see what the packaging actually looks like. So there's no jars um, where you can see, you know, the buds inside or anything like that. These are um, these are opaque con uh, containers. They're child safety sealed, labeled with the patient's information. Um, so you know, every time I go to the dispensary for any one of the patients that I may visit for. I'm always asked which patient am I there to purchase for 
at the door. So when I give them my caregiver card, they want to look up the right patient certification, and then they will be viewing that particular patient certification to make sure that they are dispensing something that is not restricted in that certification. And then when I'm at the, um, the sales uh, area, they're going to um, you know, make the transaction, I'm making my purchase, and then they are putting that patient's label on the containers. So, you know, similar to what a pharmacy would be giving you, they're always going to, to provide the patient's label and um, as well as, you know, various other labels that have a lot of information on the contents of the medicine. Um, so the grower processors, um, we have uh, 25, well, I believe 24 total right now on the commercial side. Um, one grower pro processor permit was not renewed, but the other 24 um, are intact. And one is, um, um, or rather, um, I'm sorry about that. Anyway, about 18 of them are operational. So um, the others, I believe there's 12 that actually have product that is being distributed. Um, and this, again, this is evolving probably too rapidly for me even. So um, I hope I'm not off on my numbers here, but I believe it's 18 operational dispensaries, 12 with products, and then those other um, you know, six probably going to have products fairly soon, and then the remaining, um, what does that give you? Six left that need to become operational. So lots of wheels moving here, as, as you can imagine. Um, these are very clean professional facilities. They're under camera at all times. Every single employee, every investor, um, every owner and operator has to um, has to go through the, the background check process as well. They're all going to submit fingerprints to the FBI as well. Um, we have to uh, review those clearances as well. And um, anyone with any drug-related charge at any time in their life is prohibited from working for one of the permittees, and that is you know, per, per the law. Um, so that's a pretty, pretty quick overview. Now, you don't necessarily need to know where these grower processor locations are, but I think this map at least can give you sort of the idea of how spread out they are and how nice that is because it's job opportunities all over the state for anyone over the age of 18 that, that can you know, pass that background check. Um, and they do have training that they're required to do as well that we have provided for them. The labs, um, as I said, we have um, labs uh, that are testing our products at two different phases. Um, these are third party labs. They cannot have any financial ties to any of the permittees, the grower processors or the dispensaries. They have to be completely neutral. Um, they will be collecting their own samples um, and they, again, are going to be testing for mold, pesticide, residual solvents, um, and then equally important is testing for the cannabinoid profile. So um, patients should always know how much THC is in their medicine, how much CBD. Those are just two of many, many cannabinoids that could be present in the medicine. Um, we're really just scratching the surface of, of uh, science in this area. And, um, and then beyond that are terpenes. And um, I think we have really underestimated for a very long time the value of the terpene profile. There are um, a number of terpenes that can be present, present in the, the medicine, lemonine, um, pinene, and those can add to the effects of the medicine. They can, um, they can help a patient relax. Um, I have one patient who says that the pinene helps her with her breathing. Um, so, you know, I think um, I'm very, very excited to see our research program um, get started because I think we're going to really be able to um, get some concrete data on you know what specific cannabinoids and terpenes help with exactly what conditions. Right now it's really um, so much trial and error for a lot of patients. Um, 
because you know we haven't been able to study this in the U.S. Um, the way some other countries have. Although we do have we do have studies um, now. Uh, typically, they're not the studies that um, that physicians want that will help with you know dosing and such. But we do have access to a lot of of studies, and we're just again you know scratching the surface. I think we're going to um, really have something amazing in Pennsylvania once we have this research program underway. Um, so the dispensaries, um, we have up to 150 possible dispensary locations in the commercial market um, in Pennsylvania. Right now we have, um, you know what, I'm sharing these numbers at the end. I think it's over 70 um, operational dispensaries at this point. Um, I believe 80 some permits have been issued. Um, so there are 50 total dispensary permits allowed by the law. Then each of those 50 permittees can open up to three locations. So at their primary location, they need to have uh, either an MD, DO, or a pharmacist on staff. And at their second and third location, they need to have a CRNP or a PA on staff. Um, a lot of them, I, in my observations, most of them are staffing pharmacists. Um, but that's not to say you won't see various other medical professionals as well. But the bottom line is during all operational hours, you will see a medical professional on staff. Um, and they will be sitting down with patients, doing patient consultations, going over their prescription drug list um, to make sure there are no potential drug interactions or if there are potential drug interactions, um, you know, making sure that the patient knows how to avoid those. Um, so those folks will be your sort of um, subject matter experts. Um, and a lot of dispensaries also employ patient care specialists. Um, and um, there's a lot of, of advice given, a lot of, of really, um, I think, excellent guidance given at our dispensaries. I think it's fantastic that we have medical professionals available. Um, so most likely every patient is going to be required on their first visit at a dispensary to have a medical consultation. Um, most dispensaries have that as a policy in their standard operating procedures. They will not allow a patient to come in for the first time and not sit down for a consultation. Some um, can you know, see in the system that you've had a consultation elsewhere, so they won't require you to have one with them, um, but that's, that's something that's up to them. Um, in the patient certification, which is the document that patients have to get to obtain their card, um, the uh, certifying practitioner can put in specific recommendations on dosing or you know, recommendations on the form, um, or they can defer all of those specific, um, specific recommendations to the medical professional at the dispensary. So that's really up to the certifying practitioner. So there's a map of all of our operational dispensaries available on our website, and that's at www.medicalmarijuana.pa.gov, and I will give that information to you again here. Um, so if you go to that website and you click on find a dispensary, this map pops up and uh, you just click on the green arrow and then on the left, it will populate all of that dispensary's information. There address, their phone number, their website, everything you need to know to contact them. You can even go on their website and usually view their menu um, to know if they have a product that you need in stock. Um, and then you can contact them to schedule your patient consultation. Um, and I usually recommend patients always call ahead first because, you know, like I said, they, you know, they're probably going to require you to have a consultation and um, sometimes they're booked. So you don't want to show up and, and not be able to actually be seen that day. Some of these, as you can see, there's a lot of areas in Pennsylvania where there is no dispensary and those patients are driving quite a ways to, to find the nearest one. So physicians um, who participate in the program, um, I, I, you heard me refer to them probably as certifying practitioners. Um, and these are folks that need to hold a valid Pennsylvania medical license. Um, they cannot 
be on probation um, or you know have any compromise in their uh, status and they all have to first register with the Department of Health and they have to complete a four-hour training now beyond that there is a further vetting process where um, you know folks at our, our um, Department of Health are going to look into them and just make sure that we are um, letting folks certify our patients that should have the ability to certify patients um, so patients uh, register first um, as well as doctors everybody really who participates in this program is going to, to register with the department first. Um, your next step then as a patient will be to consult with the practitioner to get your patient certification. And only after a certification is submitted online can you log in and pay for your medical marijuana ID card. Now, all of this is done um, through the patient and caregiver registry, the online system, and it's all done through pop-up instructions and emails, um, and there's really quite a bit of instruction the whole way through, um, but I will say because it's online, um, it's, you know, some patients are not comfortable working online on this. Um, they do have the ability, again, to designate a caregiver or to have, you know, any anyone help them with this process. Um, we even have some patients who don't have an email address, but they have um, a son or daughter who, who does that for them, who lets them use their email address and then they monitor that for their mom and dad and um, make sure that they're following all the instructions and the prompts. Um, so you're going to register and then be notified um, by a pop-up and by an email that your next step is to get a patient certification. That email will direct you back to the website where there is a list of all of our certifying practitioners and that list is broken up by county you can also search for a practitioner from within your caregiver profile by entering a zip code there's actually a search practitioners tab um, and you can click on that tab and plug in a zip code or a last name and pull up the practitioner's information that way um, and then after you have met with a practitioner and they've evaluated you and your medical records, they can submit an online eight section patient certification for you, um, certifying that you um, qualify for the program. And then you get an email saying your certification was submitted. You may now log in and pay for your ID card. So that's the process. So this is the landing page for the registry. And you can find this if you go to our website and you know, click on the link for the registry. So um, as you can see, the right side returning users. Um, but on the left side, I hope everyone can read this OK. So you have your physician registration if you want to be a certifying practitioner the medical professional registration for your pharmacists or CRNPs at the dispensary. Um, they all must have an, a, an, an active um, Pennsylvania medical license as well. And then your adult patient registration, which is probably the mo most straightforward um, path. Now, once you get down to caregivers, it gets a little bit more complicated. And we get a lot of questions about what which which thing to choose um, so uh, I'll just give you a very specific example so as I said I um, registered as a caregiver for my little one Anna and I chose the third option down which is caregiver registration for individuals requiring in-home support for a minor or for a person with a disability um, and that was a new caregiver registering for a new patient that's the option I chose and I actually created my profile um, at the same time that I created her profile. I was able to plug in both of our um, uh, information once I chose that option. Um, and that generated her patient identification number, which I was able to give to her neurologist so that he could submit her certification. And then it allowed me to log in and register for my background check with Identigo, which you do from your caregiver profile. And then I was you know, approved and was able to pay for my caregiver card. Now, a lot of caregivers um, uh, may miss the step that their patient has to be certified. So a caregiver um, is, is unique in that they can actually get a medical marijuana card without 
anyone seeing the doctor. So their path is different. They're getting a background check to get their card, whereas an adult patient has to get a certification to get their card. So the caregiver may go through that background check process and they're registered and um, and they've uh, you know done everything that they think they should have done. But if they go to the dispensary and they do not have a patient who is certified associated with them, their card will not work at the dispensary. So they must make sure that the patient who has designated them or who they have registered for has a patient certification. So they have a couple of steps that they have to complete um, in order to uh, legally make a purchase. So this is an image of the patient card. As you can see, pretty vague, no addresses or anything like that. Um, a lot of the important information that is stored on this card is stored in the back um, on the on the 2d barcode um, and uh, and that 2d barcode is scanned at the dispensary so um, as I said you know that C to sale system ties into the patient and caregiver registry which um, you know it's all sort of it all connects and so the dispensary staff has the technology to scan the back of the the cards the 2d barcodes and that's how they pull up the patient's information Information. So if it's an adult patient card, they're going to scan that and they're going to pull up the adult patient's record and their certification will be viewed for the purchase. If it's a caregiver card, you know, like I said, if the caregiver has multiple patients, they'll pull up um, the specific record, um, who, whoever you're there to make the purchase for, and you'll be dispensed for them specifically. Now, the patient and the caregiver cards are pretty similar. The only difference is one says patient, one says caregiver. Um, but again, um, minors cannot get their own card. So only folks 18 and over can register and um, get their own medical marijuana ID card. If they're under the age of 18, they have to have a caregiver register on their behalf. Now, the other um, patients who may rely on a caregiver would be homebound patients, anyone inpatient, and they can also have a caregiver apply on their behalf. I mean, we have, you know, um, parents with um, adult children with intellectual disability, and if, if that adult child um, is not going to be visiting the dispensary, the, the parent can be their caregiver, they can be their proxy in the system, and as long as that adult patient gets a certification, the caregiver can be their um, card holder in the dispensary and do all those visits. Now, I will tell you, um, if, if you are over the age of 18 and um, you do not have a valid medical marijuana identification card, you cannot go into the dispensary. So, um, you know, of course, minors um, need to be accompanied by either a caregiver or the patient who may be their parent, um, but if you're over the age of 18, you can't go into a dispensary unless you are card holding caregiver or patient. So if you do have, um, you know, a, a you know parent or a kiddo, an adult patient um, with with intellectual disability just to you know cite some examples um, and they do plan to go into the dispensary with you at some point in time they should also have their own um, identification card that will allow them to actually go inside the dispensary and they can do that if they have a state issued photo ID from PennDOT um, so you know it, it, it can be a little bit confusing and lots of people have lots of questions about all of this. Again, happy to help. Please um, refer anyone who's looking on or looking for guidance on how to navigate the program to our office. Um, so just an update and I think I'm actually going to just sort of um, uh, breeze through a couple of these last slides a little more quickly than I normally would because I think we're cutting it kind of close here. But um, so far, we have completed all of the temporary regulations for the grower processors, dispensaries, physicians. Um, all of those regulations are um, published in the Pennsylvania Bulletin. They're all available on our website. We issued all of the permits in two phases. Both phases have been completed, um, so giving us a total of 25, but what is now 24 grower processor permits, um, as well as 50 
dispensary permits. Um, uh, and like I said, each of those 50 can open up to three locations. And 18 grower processors and 72 dispensaries have been approved as operational so far. Um, now, I want to also tell you the, um, the research program that I referenced is um, is not part of these permits. So there are eight academic research centers. Um, so far, three of them have been issued permits, but um, phase three of their application process is um, underway right now. So hopefully the remaining permits will be awarded because um, we can have up to eight academic research centers um, that are actually um, uh, partnered with grower processors and dispensaries conducting research in the state. So that will give us um, up to eight more grower processors and up to 48 more dispensaries because each of those eight um, uh, academic research centers can um, open up to six, I believe, six dispensary locations. So um, we could see, you know, vast expansion um, in, in both sides, both the research and the commercial markets. Um, we have, of course, you know, launched the registra registries for the, the caregivers and physicians. Right now, I think this is the last published number, and it's probably grown significantly since then, but we have uh, over 147,000 patients with active medical marijuana ID cards, and uh, more than 225,000 patients have registered. Um, and are you know presumably going through the process. Over 1,600 physicians have registered, and over 1,100 physicians have completed the required training and have been approved to participate in the program. Now, as I said, there's a list available on our website of all of the practitioners, the certifying practitioners who are participating. But you may have a practitioner who is participating in the program who is not listed on the website. So along with various other recommendations that the board has made and that Dr. Levine has um, uh, adopted or, or implemented, um, we have um, the ability for a practitioner to be unlisted. So, um, so for instance, um, I, I think my daughter's neurologist may not be publicly listed. So he, um, is a certifying practitioner who wants only to be contacted by his own existing patients. So there are various practitioners who are not interested in taking on more patients for the purpose of certifying them, but who are willing, who wanted to at least be able to certify their own existing patients. And they have the ability to do that, but not be publicly listed so that they're not getting a lot of phone calls from um, you know, various other patients. So um, just, you know, note that we do have a lot of patients that call in and ask about the status um, of, of certain doctors who they think are practitioners on the list, but they don't see them on the list. So that is very much possible. Um, so our next steps, we, of course, want to encourage more physicians to register. One of the recommendations that the board has made, um, which Dr. Levine chose to um, postpone actually um, uh, uh, enforcing this rule, would be for pediatric patients to only be certified by a doctor who's board certified in pediatrics. So that's something that will be implemented once we have a sufficient number of um, doctors who are ready to certify pediatric patients who are board certified in pediatrics. Um, right now, we really don't. I think we probably have less than 20. Um, we're going to continue to educate patients and caregivers and, uh, you know, operationalize permittees, implement the research. So lots of moving parts. Um, it's, it's a very, very exciting um, program uh, as, as we continue to watch it evolve. Um, but lastly, this is our contact information. So our um, website address right there, uh, lots of information there. So I always advise patients to go onto the website when you're not actually looking for specific information. Go onto the website and familiarize yourself with the website so that when you are looking for specific information, you might 
know where to find it because there's so much there. It can be quite overwhelming when you're looking for a specific answer and there's so much information to read through um, in, in the effort to find the answer to your question. But if all else fails, just please send us an email with your question. We're always, always happy to help. Um, and we, I, I actually, as soon as I'm off of this webinar, I'm going to get right back into my um, emails and, and our, our voicemail, of course, and just um, seeing what patients need. Um, where We get hundreds of emails every day, and we just try to, to keep up on those and make sure that we are providing all of the accurate information that they're looking for. Um, so with that, I think we have 10 minutes to answer questions, which is probably a pretty good amount of time. So um, I'll turn this over to Wendy so that she can hopefully um, give me some of the questions that have come in. Great. Thank you, Lolly. Uh, that sure. was great information that you shared with us today, and we will open up the question and answer portion now. So if you do have any questions, please use the question pane on the right hand of your screen. And we'll give it a minute or two to see what comes in. That sounds good. All right, just again, remember that we will be sending out a survey. We'd love for you to complete that survey so that we can um, take that feedback and, and use it to improve our, our webinars. And a, a recording of today's webinar will be made available at the PHCA website. Wow, this is a quiet group today, Lolly. Wow. I know. I don't have any questions. Again, I will be sending this out the first for me. <laughs> with all contact information. So if you do have any questions, you can reach out to her and know that we always have PHCA resources available um, who, if they don't have the answer to the question, we certainly know where to go to try to get answers. Okay, we do have a question. Does a nursing home resident need a caregiver to register if the nursing home is willing to administer medical marijuana? Well, the key there would be um, who is going to actually be going to the dispensary and picking it up for the patient. Would that resident be able to go to the dispensary to make their purchase or would they need a caregiver to make the purchase for them and bring it there to the home? So um, I guess that that would be your answer. Um, and it's in the form of a question, my apologies, but it's it's what what does the patient have the ability to do? Great, thank you. Does that help? I don't know if I helped you or not. <laughs> All right, again, any questions that you have, if you could type them in, we'll take them now. We'll give it another minute or two and then uh, we'll send out the contact information for Lolly and for our staff if you have any questions. Okay, Great. we do have another question. How do patients pay for medical marijuana? Are oh, there any programs question. that provide financial support? So Thank you for bringing that up. Okay, so um, it is actually cash uh, business right now. A lot of the dispensaries do have um, like an app of some sort and I I don't have the information on that, to be honest, but patients can pay with a card at the dispensary. Um, but uh, most most of it is a cash business um, and insurance doesn't cover it. So because uh, it is you know, still a Schedule I um, and our law actually says very specifically, nothing in this act shall require an insurance company to cover um, the products. Um, so right now, unless we would have, you know, an amendment to the law, insurance won't pay for it. Now, we will have a hardship program established in the future. Um, Chapter 9 of the Act uh, sort of lays out a timeline for us. We have to pay back specific loans, but then there is um, a portion of a specific tax that's collected. Um, the patients don't pay any tax at all, but a tax that's collected from the grower processors. Um, and a portion of that goes into a fund. And once that fund is used to pay back loans, then we can um, establish a hardship fund 
for patients based on their financial needs. So um, we will be working towards developing that and all of that information as, as any developments are made that will be published on our website. Um, a lot of dispensaries do offer discounts right now. Um, so if you know veterans get discounts, um, senior citizens, minors, um, there's lots of different discounts that they offer. So um, I encourage patients to you know call and ask about those things as well. And um, we do offer a discount on the card fee. So patients are only going to be charged one card fee per year, no matter how how many cards they may get. Um, based on how long their certification is for. A doctor can certify a patient for up to 12 months, um, but you know, sometimes they certify them for three months or six months and the patient ends up getting multiple cards per year, but they are only ever required to pay one card fee um, outside of replacement card fees, of course. Um, but that card fee is typically $50, but if you participate in WIC, CHIP, Pace, SNAP, or Medicaid, then you can get a reduced fee of $25. So that's $25 a year to the state um, for the card fee. Great. That was a great question. Uh, we have a couple more questions. Is pricing regulated or does each dispensary set the price? So, well, I believe the Yes, the dispensaries set their own prices, um, as do the grower processors. We do have the ability to cap prices if we see price gouging. Um, the act does give us the ability to do that, but that has not been done thus far. We have not capped prices thus far. Okay. Uh, another question. Must the caregiver dispense the marijuana? Can a skilled nursing facility employee dispense the medical marijuana? So the, the law is fairly ambiguous in who's actually administering the medical marijuana. It's really, um, like I said, it's um, you know who is legally uh, allowed to purchase at the dispensary um, is key. Um, but you know we, my daughter, I can tell you firsthand, I'm not the person who's always administering the medical marijuana to my daughter. Um, I can't be, it's just not physically possible. So um, I do rely on various other caregivers who are not card holding caregivers, but they are people I trust to administer her medication. Um, all patients who don't have a card um, can request a patient authorization letter. So um, Anna has a patient authorization letter that says um, she is an authorized patient in the state of Pennsylvania and she is legally able to uh, be in possession of or be administered medical marijuana that has been legally obtained from a dispensary. And that letter goes with her everywhere she goes where she has her oil because um, that that gives some protection to a person without a card. Okay, another question we have. Do you have any knowledge of the position of the PA State Board of Nursing on administration of medical marijuana in a facility? I'm so sorry. I actually don't I don't have any any information on that at all. Okay. Uh, we've had a couple questions. If there are any more questions, we'll take them now. Otherwise, we'll uh, let you get back to your day. Okay. And and I do want to say too, this uh, the email address listed here. If um, if anyone is having issues, any patient, um, you know, please pass along our contact information. We certainly don't want anybody, um, you know feeling rudderless trying to get help with, with uh, registration or anything like that. We have staff um, that will help them. Terrific. All right, I think we're gonna wrap it up. Uh, don't forget to take time to complete the survey. Uh, we'll be on the, and be on the lookout for the, uh, the scheduled PHCA 2020 webinars. We're working on that schedule now. So keep your eyes um, out, looking out for that on our website and through our weekly uh, communications to our membership. 
Um, again, I want to thank Lolly for presenting on this topic today. And everyone, have a great remainder to your day and a wonderful holiday season. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, everyone.